And the idea that being a grown-up means that you lose a sense of humour, or you stop being funny, or stop being silly. You know, stop yeah. allowing silliness to happen in your life. Whereas, in fact, I think all the great men I've ever met were incredibly keen on silliness. They they did extraordinary things. They were amazing people, but they loved silly moments as well because you need them. They, they feed your soul. I think. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is the legendary actor and comedian who was a founding member of the satirical pop group The Heebie Jeebies. When he's not making number one hit parody songs, like the chicken song from Spinning Image, you can find him all over your television screen. He's had regular roles in Benidorm, The Legacy of Reginald Perrin and Trevor's World of Sport and can be found in a variety of appearances on the silver screen throughout his decades-long career. You can catch him creating comedy gold on the airways in his many roles on BBC Radio 4 with shows like Nighty Night, Old Harry's Game and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He is also the voracious voice behind Inspector Stein. He's got a face that fits fabulous guest appearances, with shows like Only Fools and Horses, Mr Bean, Coronation Street, Outnumbered and One Foot in the Grave. It would seem that no classic TV comedy is fully functional without his funny force being featured. Mike Fenton Stevens. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you very much, Paul. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely well, to be on the guest list again. <laughs> so let's go back to the start. You were born in Bermondsey, which I, I think is it within the sound of Bow Bells. Well, maybe just about. So it is south of the river. So my entire family are absolutely died in the wall, what you'd call Cockneys, I think, in as much as they were dockers. I came from, I come from a long line of people who worked in the docks. And uh, yes, and in fact, the Stevens may well originally come from Stevedore, so working oh. on the docks rather than on the ships. Uh, that's possibly the derivation of the name for for us. It's why we we are Stevenses. And uh, so all my uncles were dockers. My father was rather good at writing. He had beautiful handwriting. So from a very young age, he was pushed in the direction of being of calligraphy, really, of, of being a bookkeeper. He was not stupid. He was, you know, a reasonably clever boy. He left school at 14, but immediately got a job not in the factory or not on the decks, on the docks, but but actually in the office. So he started off working in the office, which for, for somebody from my family was a real step up. And, of course, he then realised that actually he probably should have continued his education. And he went to night school, started studying at night school. And then he joined the army. And then after the war, he went back to night school and continued to train and uh, qualified as a solicitor. So we sort of did that social jump that people do. And my father was very, very keen because he was um, he was a bit of an actor, a bit of a, of a performer himself. He liked acting. He liked singing and uh, had his own, his own sort of old time musical group that he did right through his life. He loved it. Uh, he was very good. Actually, he was a very funny man, but he he was chameleon he was able to um, as a solicitor he was a criminal solicitor and some say that that may well be a perfect description of his work <laughs> no ambiguity <laughs> there yeah. no but he was able to get along with the criminals just as well as he was able to get along with the top barristers so i saw i would watch him i worked with him for a year before i went off to university and uh, i watched him flip between people so people would come and he'd say, no, look, you know, behave yourself. Don't cause any trouble, all right, because he's a bloke in there. You know, I mean, just try it, for goodness sake, don't get riled, all right? Because you start getting angry, you're going to be in big trouble, all right? 
And people go, you're all right, H, you're all right. I've got it, I'll be all right, don't worry. And he go, good. And then he turned around and say, the man's an absolute rascal. He's extraordinary. <laughs> Uh, to the, and the barrister said, no, that's no trouble at all, uh, Harry. Uh, no, um, uh, what was his name again? Well, people call him the Nipper, but uh, his real name's Alf. Alf? Really? Uh, that, was, that was my dad's life. That's fabulous. So, I mean, was, do you think humour in that sense is genetic, that you got it from him? Or were you a, a natural, did you have that show-off gene as a child? I did. Absolutely, I had that show-off gene, although it was incredibly encouraged by my father he loved me to do it he we used to go on holiday he would always pick holidays where he could basically spend the entire week performing so he loved holiday camps we went to holiday camps my father I can't remember ever going on holiday where my father wasn't voted king of the week which is I think uh, you know quite prestigious so he was in everything he would take a suitcase with one or two pieces of clothing in it and another suitcase with all his costume changes. So he had all the things for the topsy-turvy competition, for the fancy dress competition. He had, for when he had to be Tarzan at the swimming pool, he had a sort of a, a loincloth that he used to wear. He was prepared for everything. And he went there and, and entered every single competition. And I think, to a large extent, people enjoyed him being there. He was very good fun. It was it was great being with my dad on those holidays because everywhere we went, people would go, all right, uh, Harry, all right, mate, every morning, morning, Harry, and he'd go, morning, morning, and you'd think he worked there. He was he was brilliant. But did you not reach a stage in, in teenage years when it it became a little bit too much because most teenagers find that clawing? You would sense. think so, wouldn't you? I was a strange teenager. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. In fact, I just wanted to join in. So I'd got the bug by then. So as a, as a young boy, he would get me to, I remember the very first time he, he persuaded me to do it. I was about six, I think. He said, I'll do this song, then I'll do these jokes, and then I'll do another song. And just as I'm about to start the second verse, you come on and pull on my coat, okay? And I said, right. He said, then you say, excuse me, have you seen what your son's doing in the swimming pool? And I say, yep, yeah, don't worry. All little boys do that in the swimming pool. And you say, <laughs> not from the top diving board, okay? And I said, OK, Dad. And he said, just let's practice it. We did it a few times. He said, you got it? I don't know. And then I walked out. I walked up from the audience and pulled on it. He said, what? What? Get up. I'm singing. Go away. What do you want? And I said, hey, have you seen what your son's doing this? And I, of course, I did the joke. Got an enormous round of applause. And, you know, and I was, I was, it was, I was hooked. It was too oh. lovely. <laughs> Well, uh, with, uh, that's interesting, that whole thing about being hooked by mm. uh, 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 by the thing, because um, it is a hook, isn't it? Once you get a laugh, yes. it, it's a drug, isn't it? You, you, you know, the, getting a laugh from strangers in a darkened room is some kind of drug that should be available on the NHS. <laughs> I think. It's very true. But also the joy of it, I found, because I'd seen it with my father, this ability to be the entertainer, to be the person that people look to when you needed something to liven a moment up. That person, that person in a room is always um, admired and valued. They're important people. And and so actually to get some sort of value into my, my life, to make me feel worth something, entertaining people was a great thing for me. I mean, I recently went and had a drink with somebody who I went on holiday with when I was 16. And I hadn't seen her since then. She now is very big in advertising and owns her own production company. So I wish I'd known that years ago. <laughs> anyway, she was lovely. And she came along and I said, oh, God, I was so embarrassing on that holiday, wasn't I? Because all I did was organise entertainments the whole time and got everybody to do sing-alongs. And, and she said, oh, no, you were brilliant. I mean, we just, you know, we knew that every evening you'd stand up and get everything going. And I went... Really? Because I don't remember myself that way. I look back at it and think, oh, you bumptious little so-and-so. But, you know, it's nice that she remembers me like that and sees it as being a valuable thing. I mean, in the, thinking of your podcast, that there is absolute value in the ability to make people laugh, without a doubt. Yeah, and do you think that it actually changes, because the whole Humorology project is based on how it can change people's lives by understanding the value, not just of being funny, but of being good humoured, yes. um, of, of lightness of touch, of being somebody you want to be around. How important do you think that is? 
I think it's very important. I think if in those moments when you're, you see, I, I do it naturally. I've, I've, because I've done it all my life, I do it absolutely naturally. In the moments where I'm most angry or where I'm, something really riles me the most, usually politics, I'm always, I will see a funny line in it or I will see something comic in it and it dissipates it. So it's it's good for my health, without a doubt, that I'm then able to chuckle to myself at, wouldn't it be funny if, if they'd said that, or wouldn't it be funny if this happened? So I'm always seeing the, the humour in the situation, the comedy of it. And sometimes, you know, to, 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 very black, I have a very black sense of humour, I'm very dark, you know, so it, sometimes it's things that I'm, I really can't then say out loud, because people say, I'm sorry, are you making a joke about this? And I go, well, I am in my head, I'm afraid, yes, I am. Well, it's interesting when you talk about dark humour because we've had um, uh, some guests on who really understand it from people who work in medicine, um, like Dr mm -hmm. Phil Hammond, who is um, yeah. uh, hilarious and very smart. But uh, I used to train doctors at Guy's Kings and St Thomas's many years ago, and the surgeons were had the blackest humour. But mm. we also had the uh, John Sweeney, the uh, legendary reporter from Panorama and yes. all those who's who's currently, as we speak, in Kiev, mm. right in the middle of everything. And he said one of the only ways to survive is to actually laugh at these things, because if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Yes, without a doubt. I've always felt that there really shouldn't be anything that you can't find humour in, because I think it's it's... It's healing. It's a, there's a healing sense to, to humour, I think. It, it can get you through things. You know, um, I remember, but, you know, my mother once said to me, I said, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to church today, Mum. And she was a very strict Catholic. And she said, what? I said, I'm not going to church. I'm going, I'm going to Brighton. I'm going to the uh, car rally with my friends. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 17. I can make these decisions myself. I, I don't believe in it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going. And she went, okay, all right. No, you're an adult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make your own decisions. But I just say this. If you crash and you die, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. You see, now, she didn't see the humour in that, but I I laughed about it all day long. And so that what could have been this, you know, my, how dare she tell me what to do, became something for me which is rather a joyous moment. You know, so um, I don't it's know. It's an escape, I isn't it? It's, 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 it's an escape. It's a... Yeah, and and uh, but then the best uh, people in the world at uh, becoming escape artists are also people who can allow other people to escape with them, aren't they? Yes, yes, yes. With that sense that of uh, pointing out to people the absurdity of something, when when uh, you know, I mean, I I just feel that if you look at all the people who <laughs> cause all the problems in the world, they're people who have no sense of humour at all. I mean, Donald Trump clearly is a man uh, totally humorless. He has no sense of irony. Otherwise, he would be laughing at himself all the time because he's just full of irony. And Putin, you know, there's a man who just is completely lacking in self-criticism. And often that's what humor is, is the ability to see how silly you are. Well, absolutely. And, and uh, well, it's, it's funny because uh, that silliness... Um, is kind of a, a really rare talent, isn't it, to actually <laughs> be able to do it? And uh, actually, for a moment, I, you and I have silliness in our background because mm. um, uh, we've got a history with comedy songs. Um, yes. <laughs> because you and I were amongst the last people and the last generation of acts that had major hit records mm. with comedy songs. Why do you think that there's no longer a market for that genre? I don't know. I think there is the comedy poetry. There's quite a sort of a market for that. There's a, a number of stand-ups who are very successful, you know, Tim Key and people like that, who, who do very funny. Uh, so the, the ability to be funny in rhyme, as it were, uh, through is, is still there. But I think that actually, I don't know. I mean, I, what are you parodying? That's the problem. If you, if, if in fact music itself has become beyond parody sometimes but i you would have thought that anybody who watched any music in the 1970s would have uh, would now be saying you know well actually music is very staid because you only have to look at a band like sweet and with their ridiculous hair 
and their enormous flares and great big platform boots, all singing about, you know, there must be a way to blockbuster. What the hell is that as a lyric? It doesn't make any sense to anybody. It's, you know. it's a ballroom blitz. It's a ballroom, what well, just <laughs> glorious songs. I mean, brilliant songs, without a doubt. Uh, if you want to dance, put them on. But, you know, yeah. it's mad, absolute mad, absolutely mad. I don't know. I mean, I think... I, I do listen to, to songs now, listen to music now, and think I'd, I'd love to still be doing parodies of, of pop groups. I'd love to, because actually they sort of... There's, a, there's always been an element with pop music where they take themselves too seriously. So it's easy to, to bring them down, I think. It's easy to point out that absurdity. Yeah. Uh, who do you think you would, you would parody these days, though? I mean, that's... the. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, the chicken song was obviously a black lace. Um, it's true, parody. yes. And yes. Uh, you know, of probably of something like Agadoo. Uh, but do you think? Well, I mean, I would, if I were writing a song at the moment, I would be writing uh, an Ed Sheeran song in his style, but basically using riffs from lots of other groups and saying <laughs> and saying, "Do you like the new thing I've written? This is something else I just came up with." You know, <laughs> we'd always we'd probably be sued, but. <laughs> But, you know, it, as a comic idea, the idea of him writing lots of things, basically, I mean, it's a bit like writing, if you were going to write an Oasis song, basically writing in lots of lyrics from the Beatles would be a good way to parody them, you see. So yes. it, just as it, the suggestion is in is in the act itself rather than necessarily being up front. Well, no, that's a good idea. We'll get mm. working on it, shall we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, well, but your voice has been very important to you. We talked about you singing um, the, the heebie-jeebies and mm. um, the chicken song. I, I have to say, and this is, you know, I don't normally suck up to guests, but you have the most mellifluous voice. <laughs> In fact, I was telling a, a female friend of mine that I was having a new on, and she said, I go weak at the knees. Oh, my word. When I hear Mike Fenton Stevens' voice. <laughs> Uh, uh, she listens to the time capsule, uh, my time capsule podcast. Um, voice is very important for our listeners, for anybody who's having to present themselves. Mm -hmm. Did you work consciously to improve that voice or any aspect of it with rhythm, pace, depth? Anything? I did, yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, only over time, I've spent a lot of time cutting out the errs and the you knows and thinking about what I'm saying more and trying to be more fluid and more fluent in what I'm saying. And also, without really intending to, my voice has got deeper. I think that's just age. But uh, I don't know. That's probably abuse as well. I have done a lot of plays over the years where I've just shouted a lot and been, you know, ridiculous. I've, I've sung in different styles which are not necessarily the best thing to do for your singing voice. I've had to sing in the style of other people, and that can quite often mean that you're you're twisting and slightly changing your own natural voice, which can, you know, to an extent, damage it. And I think that maybe I've got deeper and slightly gruffer as a result of uh, <laughs> of, of using my voice badly. So it wasn't necessarily a, a good thing that I did, but it's what it's ended up as. But it's interesting because the voice can be so important um, for business people or people in positions of power. I think it was Michael Caine who said the basic rule of human nature is that powerful people speak slowly and subservient people quickly because they don't, uh, if they don't speak fast enough, nobody will listen. Isn't yes. that? Do you think that's true and something that our listeners could take away? Well, I think the, if you're talking about how to address people, doing something at the right pace is absolutely important. If somebody speaks too slowly when they're explaining something to you, then you get slightly annoyed, don't you, in the fact that, that you think, well, I know where you're going with this. Or, in fact, if they're too detailed in the explanation, you feel as if you're ahead of them. So it's very important to make sure that what you're saying is, to an extent, succinct, but also interesting. And that, again, is where humour can come into it, I think. Without a doubt, almost certainly, if you were starting almost any presentation, if you can start it with a joke, then you're, you're on to a winner. If once people have laughed at something, that they're on your side, they feel relaxed, 
it relaxes you enormously without nearly everybody who goes into the idea of business presentation to having to set up and present something in a way they over rehearse i think and you rehearse to the point where you're saying it so it sounds as if you don't mean it do you know what i mean that it becomes yes. mechanical and the skill that that you can learn from actors i think or from people who are good speakers naturally is that they they hold your attention and they can hold your attention with a pause they can hold your attention by speeding up or, and with changes of tone and everything else. But you have to say the thing as if it's coming into your head at that moment. Not something, not something I have practiced and I would say, and there are 72 of them. <laughs> no, nobody yeah. says of them. They say of them or, you know, generally, you know, the is a, is a word that is constantly used by people when they're doing presenting. The, and we don't say the. Nobody no. says the, you say the. No, well, with my psychological hat on, I get brought in to actually help um, CEOs and business people to uh, how to speak and how mm. to put it across. Now, obviously, my, I've got two prongs because I was a performer for many years, yes. uh, but also um, the psychology of it and what you're thinking. And I'm interested from an actor's point of view, because I'm always telling people that you should be listening. And mm. actors are always, my son's at drama school, and it's all about listening. Yes. Um, and, and being properly engaged. And from a psychological perspective, being properly engaged with your audience, whether that's one person or a whole uh, sort of auditorium full, mm -hmm. Is the clue, is that what you think you're doing, whether consciously or unconsciously? It's certainly what I'm doing, I think, when I'm doing the podcast, without a doubt. Uh, I think it's very important to listen in those circumstances. I mean, I'm the host. And a number of people have said to me after we finished recording, you're such a good listener. And I think, well, do you expect me not to be listening? while we're doing this because this is I'm trying to make a living here I'm trying to make something that I think is worthwhile so I want to hear what you're saying and it's it's a lovely way to practice actually instead of practicing speaking I think it is a good thing to practice listening to letting people finish their sentence let them get to the end don't jump in on them let them say what they're going to say and in fact if they then go on let them go on but if you hear something that you want to comment on put it in your head, just hold it in your head and save it. And then when they finish saying what they want to say, you can say, yes, yes, no, I agree with you. The thing you were saying about, and you can take people back again, you don't have to do it at that moment. And the only reason people do it is because they're frightened they're going to forget it. And in a way, if you do forget it, then it's not as important as you thought it was. I, I completely agree. And I think the masters of the the craft which I include you in are doing the funny thing is I was listening to Nikki Campbell on BBC Radio 5 Live today and a phone-in is a, a strange uh, thing yes. because you've got people who are not used to being on the radio but what I really noticed is he gave them more than enough time yes he, he didn't worry about dead air no he lets people think and quite often you need to Somebody does need that moment to sort out in their head what they're going to say, I think. Yeah. Mm. He's very so, good at it, as you, Nicky. He's, uh, he, and he's very empathetic, empathetic as, I think, as a person. He's got a great sense of, of listening to people, and, and even if he doesn't agree with it, because that is one of the great quandaries of doing those sort of phone-ins, is you will have people who you think, no, I completely disagree with you about this. But in a way, you have to let them air their views unless it's you know objectionable or absurd and then you can say no that's ridiculous sorry bye you know but um yeah but you know generally if it's just something because that you would disagree with you have to let them say it you have to let them make their point and you say well you know and it, you know as a dj it's not about you particularly i think a lot of djs make that mistake that <laughs> Their programs are about the music they play or the conversations they're having with other people. So the people they've got on, it's not about them at all. I love DJs. What makes you love, Mike? Mm. <laughs> you see, now I get hysterical at, um, at children. Children are the thing that makes me laugh the most. 
I've, I've, I've done a lot of pantomimes in my time and I do it in a way against the advice of my wife, who every time I do it, she says to me, why are you doing it? You know, you come back every night and go, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. It's such hard work. I can't believe it. Three shows we've done today. I've got to go straight to bed. I'm back there at 10 o'clock in the morning. My voice is going. I'm, oh, God. And I do. I moan like mad when I'm doing it. But the moment I get on stage and you see children laughing hysterically at things, really simple things, and the enjoyment they get out of things, it, I get such a lift from it. And I love being with children. I love children getting jokes, learning comedy, watching them learn comedy. I've got four grandchildren and there are different stages. And one of my grandchildren is autistic, so he finds comedy very difficult because he takes everything literally. literally. So comedy is about, in a way, twisting things and, and deceiving people. And you, you lead them down one path and then you change direction. And he doesn't get that at all. He doesn't understand what you're doing. So if you are over a long time would then explain the joke to him, he goes, ah, I see, uh, yes, no, I see, yes, yes. It's still not funny to him. He just he doesn't think it's funny. Whereas my granddaughter, his sister, absolutely gets comedy and always has. She made the most fantastic joke the other week. I mean, if, if I'd written it, I would be delighted. She was dressing her dolls and uh, we were dressing uh, Elsa from Frozen. And uh, and she said, she said, well, put a coat on, Grandad, that's it. Just do that and do her dress up. There we are. She looks lovely. I said, no shoes. She said, oh, she hasn't got any shoes, but you know, cold never bothered her anyway. <laughs> and I knew, it was, I knew it was a joke. She yeah. meant it as a joke. And it's yeah. just, it, she was so flippant with it. She just flipped it off. But cold never bothered her anyway. But it's the delivery as well, isn't it? Oh, it was great. I was, I was did, just. Did oh, she have the little glint in her eye? She did. Afterwards. She gave. She after she said it, she said it looking away from there. She just looked but back at me back. and I said, "See what I did." Timing. Ah, there's there's timing some gene in there, isn't there? I hope so. And when I hope yeah. it's from, it may be from me. Boy, it may be that I've just forced comedy on them their entire lives. I, I never see them without just constantly doing ridiculous jokes. Well, I, I'm not sure that you can force comedy on children because isn't that that whole social science thing about children laugh be between three and four, 400 times a day, whereas uh, adults only laugh 17.5 times yes. a day. Yes, isn't and, it strange? Well, and and but isn't it really that we could learn a lot more? And and why when when my son was born, it was like giving my mother the best gift she could ever imagine. Yes. I mean, literally, it was yeah. the joy that it broke. <laughs> I mean, it, she she wanted to keep him five years old forever. That's the only yeah. problem. It's true, uh, though, but there there are many things I think you can learn from children. One of them, without a doubt, is that thing of laughing. It's the thing of finding things funny and just letting it be funny and just enjoying the fact that things are funny. And you, if you do that in life, you will walk around the place with a great big smile on your face. I, I make a point of doing it because, you know, like everybody, every now and again, I find myself in a, in a sullen mood and, and I only need to remind myself how much more enjoyable the world is when I when I snap out of that and start seeing the world as, as the funny and absurd and amazing thing it is, you know, and children do. And the other thing is that sense of amazement, that sense of, of, of extra, the world being extraordinary and extraordinary things happening. And children, well, we all know that a small child, if you say to them, um, so we have to go to the shops now, why? Well, we need to do some shopping, why? Well, we need to get some food for later, why? They will say why to everything. And that's fine. We stop saying why. And, and to a large extent, it's our own fault then if we end up with, well, with the leaders we have and with the world run the way it is, because we ought to say, why? Why are you doing that? Why, why isn't there the money for that when there was the money for this? Why? And we don't. We just accept these things over and over again. COVID's over, apparently. Why? <laughs> Because it's not on the news, Mike. Because we don't talk about it anymore. But, yes. And all those things. And, you know, I mean, that's a, it's a flippant thing to say. But, um, but it seems that in so many senses, that, that, you know, there are many phrases that, that particularly politicians develop in order to just divert things. I mean, we, we, we haven't got a money tree, you know. 
I said, well, you have, you have actually, it's us. You know, we're the money tree. Yeah. So ask us, you know, if you really think that if we, you know, ask us if we think it's worth spending more money on the NHS. And we might well say, yes, take it from us in tax. We might Absolutely. do. Absolutely. But don't, I, don't assume that we don't want to spend it. Um, well, there is a line in two, um, uh, a lock, stock and two smoking barrels, which is one of my favourite lines, which is, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Very good. Uh, uh, that's, uh, but I was really interested in you saying, because really what it boils down to your, uh, is your attitude Mm -hmm. And the Americans have a saying, which is your attitude dictates your altitude, oh. how high you will go. Mm. And really that attitude of, uh, of a childlike response in the sense that everything is interesting or, you know, or, and asking why mm. is an attitude that, that can change your whole demeanour and bring you joy, can't it? Yes, I think so. And I think, you know, particularly if you're talking about in a work situation, I think the people who, who question things are, are so useful. You know, so many things are assumed all the time. We do things the same way and we often, we all have done. And I, I you know, I can only really talk from the point of view of being an actor, but sometimes you will go into a rehearsal process which is the situation with an, as an actor when you're supposed to say why or what if or how about this. You're supposed to be coming up with all sorts of ideas, many of which, most of which, you will reject. But it's not a problem to come up with ideas. It shouldn't be. And quite often, you know, you might be working with a director who sort of says, well, I've already had all the ideas, I think, so I know where we're going. So I don't really want your ideas. And that's not a healthy situation. Or you'll find some young actor comes into it, who the whole time just stops things all the time and says, should we, does this work? Are we, are we doing it the right way here? Shouldn't I be doing this? Or what about this? And that, again, can become annoying if you think you know what you're doing. But at the same time, when that's happened to me, because you, in a way, have to show respect in acting, unlike most other professions, you have to show respect on all levels. So you have to listen to somebody who's only playing a couple of, only got a couple of lines in, in this scene. And the person who's got loads of lines, in a way, has to defer to them almost as much as they have to defer to them. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a very strange hierarchy. And so it's it's rude in a way to not let somebody ask questions even if you think well i know all the answers to these i know all the things you're going you know because i've been there and i've done it all you will always i think in those situations particularly if you're going with that attitude discover that you don't know it all and that you didn't know the answer to that and that you will discover something new which is going back to your point about asking why. Why is mm. it like that? Because uh, obviously the older we get, perhaps the more intransigent we get um, and go, I've always done it this way. Yes. You know, it's, it's like the parent who says, because I said so. <laughs> Not as bad as don't do what I do, do what I say. say That's the one exactly. I always hated. <laughs> well, that's so unfair. <laughs> that is so unfair. Just because I'm small... Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's true. But um, the other part of what we're talking about is, is does the humour actually aid the resilience to get through those tough situations and be more creative and, and, and allow us into, into that, that world easier? Because people are always talking today about, you know, wellness and stress and... Um, it's suddenly the watchword. Whereas I think a humorous uh, attitude to life is what releases and, uh, that stress and aids that resilience. Yes. And in fact, those sort of, um, those sort of attitudes, the attitudes of wellness and relaxation and letting things go and all those sort of things can seem rather over serious. I always think, you know, you can, you quite often sort of go, there's no room for any comedy in this, is there? They're really, you know, if we're lying here doing our yoga and thinking and going back into ourselves and letting ourselves be aware of our body and letting ourselves know the inner self and look at oneself and, and break everything away and just let it all... And somebody farts, 
<laughs> they all ignore it. They will just, you can't, no, no farting at this moment, please. It's just serious. Whereas I would be crying with laughter. Well, it's funny. We had uh, recently on the podcast um, John Lloyd, your old mm. producer at Spitting yes. Image. Yes. Who was talking, he said he never wanted to do yoga, but as he describes it, yoga saved his family's life. But the yoga class he goes to, he said, is the funniest yoga class because everybody's making jokes all the time. So Brilliant, if somebody yeah. does fart, everybody <laughs> falls around. Yes. And, you know... The, yes, yeah, so you if you get to a certain age, if you're going to do yoga, if you don't do yoga and at the same time go, oh, Jesus, <laughs> oh, that... Oh, I haven't stretched that for a bit. You know, you've got to, haven't you? Otherwise, in a way, you feel you feel like an outsider. There's always got to be... That's the way, I think, that you're going to get more people into it. The great problem with all those things is that everybody, you, when you first start them, everybody around you looks like an expert and you think, I don't fit. I can't fit in. I'll never fit. Whereas, in fact, they, they want you to fit. You want to be able to fit. And the way to make people feel at home, I think, is to go, it's all right. We all go, oh, when we bend down on that one. You know? Well, that, that, that's very interesting because uh, you, you actually, do you think you, it's useful to be able to laugh at yourself in those situations, not take yourself so seriously? Is that part of, because when you said, you know, you need to start with yourself and mm. go, I'm ridiculous. <laughs> yes. So welcome to the world. Yes, no, absolutely. Then, And then in a way, very few people are going to be annoying to you in life, I think, if you've always got them in comparison to you. And if you are able to look at yourself and constantly notice, because we all do it, and if we don't notice it in ourselves, then we're not really being aware of ourselves, I think, because we all do the most absurd things. I find myself chuckling at myself. It's a very healthy thing to do. I find myself just doing, and then I, I chuckle because I could, in a way, can see myself from outside. And I look and go, and then, you know, things have happened to me in my life that I, I think, oh, God, I wish somebody had filmed that. That was so ridiculous. I was so absurd. I once stood on the station at Tunbridge Wells, where I live, and I was going for an interview for a, a job and I was wearing a very smart suit. And uh, I also had a contract that I realised I had to post. And I'd been told, you've got to get this in the post. It's, it's going to be late and you've got to get it in before you start the job next week. So it's all very important things. And I stood there and I, I thought, oh, thirsty. I bought myself a glass of milk. I like milk. I bought a glass of milk in a little styrofoam cup. And the man said uh, over the tannoy, the train from Tunbridge Wells to Charing Cross is delayed by 10 minutes due to leaves. And I went, oh, God. And I looked at my watch, which meant I poured the milk all down the front of my suit. And then I went, ah, oh, I flapped the contract in the letter in my hand, which then flew out of my hand and went onto the rail. And, and I went, ah, oh, oh, my God. And then I stopped and I looked around thinking, God, I hope somebody saw that. That'll make their day. Yeah. Oh. You know, imagine if you'd one. seen that happen. And, of course, everybody was behind newspapers and nobody was, <laughs> I couldn't see anybody shaking. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, what a shame. Because it was just such a joyously absurd moment and one that you could never recreate. So the, the inadvertent absurdity of life, I think, is a thing to be indulged and enjoyed. And, and don't you think that that actually helps that inadvertent absurdity, as you 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 so prosaically put it, um, <laughs> is the, one of the things that makes us like people more? Because if you think about people who you don't really like, they're generally talking about themselves up all the time. Mm -hmm. I did this great thing and then I won this thing. We don't want to be around those people, do we? No. We want to be around the people who tell us the story of looking at their watch and spilling milk on themselves. Uh, I know, and but the point is you can't help but notice the wonderful things about people, I think. You will notice the things that are strong in people. You will notice the things that, where people are skillful at something. You can't help it. And, and we all admire that in people. So you will see those. So it's important, I think, that those people show the flip side of the coin. Well, I, I completely agree. Do you think that potentially everyone is funny? 
or is it a gift given to the few? I think it's forced out of a lot of people. I think they, you can lose a sense of, of comedy. You can lose a sense of when you're being funny or how to be funny. You lose the, the confidence to do it, for a start, you know, because, you, because you don't do it. So the fact that you don't do it, people say, oh, I'm, I, I can't tell jokes, so I, I don't know, I don't know, I'm, I'm never funny. I'm not funny, me. Uh, you know, and that, that's something that I think has probably been said to them for many years, maybe when they were very young. Uh, also, a lot of people are told when they're young, you know, stop that now. You know, you've got to grow up. And the idea that being a grown up means that you lose a sense of humour or you stop being funny or stop being silly. You know, stop yeah. allowing silliness to happen in your life. Whereas, in fact, I think all the great men I've ever met were incredibly keen on silliness. They, they did extraordinary things. They were amazing people, but they loved silly moments as well because you need them they, they feed your soul i think but isn't that what makes you love people more is that that inherent silliness that's not taking themselves too seriously no uh, I, it may be why they got where they they got to in fact it, you know, I, I think about, so. you know it may be why they've achieved what they've achieved because they were able to differentiate between absurd ideas or silly ideas or things that oh, no that's just ridiculous and then every now and again would go do you know what that is important that is the important thing hmm and i must do that more often you know yeah so all those without it without without fail all the great people i've ever met when i met them they told me their name and these are people who everybody knew their name it's a lesson in life, I think, that we should always... The assumption that people know who you are. And then the great actor, uh, Anthony Quayle, who was sort of a father figure to me when I was a very young, um, act, very young man and an actor, I was very, very fortunate to fall into his company and to become so close to him. It, <laughs> I was standing in the wings at the Old Vic, first time I've been on stage in London, and I was very nervous. And uh, we always gathered at the beginners even though we didn't come on stage for about 10 minutes and we would stand in the wings in the corner just chatting and talking about how the family might oh great great good kids oh, the kids are, you know good how, how's your wife what have you been doing what did you do last night and and you got anybody in we just chat about things we tell each other jokes and have a laugh and then we'd go okay right we're on and we'd go on and this particular night i was thinking right i'm it's the old vic there's critics out there it's very important i was standing and pacing and thinking about my lines which I knew inside out, of course. And he came up to me and said, all right. And I went, yeah, yeah, fine, good. He went, good. Bit, bit nervy, are you? And I went, no, no, I'm, I'm all right, all right. I I'm fine, Tony, just, you know, just concentrating. He went, okay. This, this old bloke gets on a bus. And I thought, oh, shut up. Will you shut up? I'm going to go on stage with the old Vic. Shut up. And he said, the old bloke gets on a bus. I went, yeah. He went, uh, and he's a bit drunk. So um, the bus conductor says to him, Excuse me, sir, are you drunk? He said, I, be I beg your pardon. And she said, oh, you're drunk, aren't you? He said, I, I have had one or two libations, yes. She said, but you, I, sorry, you, you can't come on here in that condition. And he turns to her and he says, I, I beg your, your pardon. Do you know who I am? And she says, no, I don't. He said, then how do you know it's me? <laughs> and I laughed, as you have. And he went, we're on. And we walked on. And I went on that stage completely relaxed. And we were supposed to enter laughing. And so he'd, he'd led me up to that moment and took, took all the nerves out of my body. It, it was one of the most generous things that has ever happened to me in, in acting. And it was a very simple thing. And that's a sign I always think of great people is that in the moment when him as the lead actor, it was his company, he was about to go on stage at the Old Vic where he played many times and people would be ready to knock him down if he didn't do it well. He was thinking about me. That's, uh, that's beautiful. And also, I, I think that's, uh, from a psychological standpoint, that lesson in the more you try and hold something and concentrate on it, the further away it goes. Yes, so he was very also, much. Uh, you know... Um, he knew, he knew that, you know, at this moment you need to be relaxed. That's what you need relaxed. to be. Not, not, not you know, pacing up and down and worried about your first line. 
it's mm. state management in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in my terms. That's what we call state management is managing the state. As soon yes. as you go, uh, I'm sure you've been in the situation. I've been in the situation, you know, at the comedy store and you go, what's the next line? <laughs> it's terrible. And, and and you know i mean also i was probably playing the guitar what's the next chord as well oh. and you go white knuckled and at that moment you know you have to release it mm. and just put your attention on your partner or on the, on on the audience mm -hmm. but you cannot go inside your own head because no. from uh, just a little aside but the conscious mind can only hold between five and nine pieces of information. Right. The unconscious can hold millions of pieces mm. of information. And you see that and happen to people on things like Dragon's Den. You see, you know, as an actor, you watch it and go, oh, God. Oh, no, I can see where they're going. They're going down that path. They, they're talking, but they're thinking about the thing that's coming up. And so they're not concentrating on what they're saying. And so they're not saying it well. And it doesn't and, look real because it sounds as if they're just saying something while that clearly their eyes are somewhere else, <laughs> their mind is somewhere else, so they're not holding the attention of these people. These people don't believe what they're saying. And then they can't remember what it is I say after this thing, so they start to panic, and it all falls apart. And you, you yeah. recognise it as an actor, you think, because we've all made that mistake. Oh, of mm. course. And, and But by the way, it's, you know, that people listening to this, it's something tangible you can take away. You've mm. got to the first chapter in my first book was called It's All About Them. And part of that is because you, you have to be connected to them, not yes. inside your own head. Because, the uh, funny enough, that's the way hypnosis works, is if you right. fill up the conscious mind. Yes. People just fall out. And so, I mean, when you have done your best acting, you weren't really consciously there, were you? No, I wasn't making decisions about it as I did it. No, absolutely not. I wasn't thinking, right, next I'll do this. Uh, oh, uh, when I come to that bit, I'm going to do this. No, I was absolutely... What I was doing is exactly what you were saying in a, mo a, a moment ago, is I was listening to the other actor, I was looking at the other actor, and I was thinking about what they were saying and what they were doing. And then when it came to my line, it came out as if I just thought of it, <laughs> which is an, it's an extraordinary thing. When you, if you ever stop and start to analyze it as you're doing it, it you again can fall apart because you go, this doesn't make any sense because I know those lines. And yet I'm not thinking about them. I'm not thinking what, you know, I know I'm going to say that. And yet I don't know I'm going to say that. It's kind of, I was going to say you can cage the songbird, but you can't make it sing, you know, <laughs> it, it, but the tighter you hold something, the less control you have over it. Yes. It's a lightness of touch and be able to do it. I mean, I, you know, speak for a living and, you know, do keynotes and, and trainings. Mm. I, I turn up. I, I'll tell you a quick story. A friend of mine, John Farron, who was at the BBC, we were down in Cannes. Um, for the television festival and we're mm -hmm. out at two o'clock in the morning and I was doing the opening address uh, in the morning and he <laughs> half staggered up to me in that drunken joshing way and went what's your first line tomorrow <laughs> and I went I have no idea and he went bollocks every good speaker always knows their first line and I went no really good speakers turn up engage and then let it happen. Mm. And that's, mm. I, I think, now in acting, you do need to know your first line, but the, the theory behind it is the same. Yes. Just... It's, 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 it's why, and I think the comedy store players use it as a technique with uh, a lot of business. They go out and talk to people about the, the ability to improvise. And, yeah, Neil and Malarkey. Be, and, you know, yeah, Neil does it all the time, but being, uh, being, being free. So you've got a sense of what's going on, but you're, you're free, you're open to ideas. And being open to ideas is, is, the, is the key, I think. If you've already made your mind up, there's no point in having the meeting. If I asked you to make a business case mm -hmm. for humour, what would you include in it, Mike? A joke. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to. But I would, I would cite all the people that I think I've spoken about, and I would cite the people... You see, I would also cite the people who 
have got to where they want to be and use humour to deflect things, to get away with things. Sadly, humour can be used not only as a productive thing, but also as a way of blocking things, also a way of, of disguising things. So, you know, I would suggest that, for example, Boris Johnson, for much of his career, has used humour as a way of, of just getting around the fact that people are saying, I'm sorry, is, is that true? And then he'll make a joke. And uh, and the thing passes, and and then passes, and then another one passes, and it just goes on and on and on. And he's just laughing all the time, having a whale of a time. You know, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? But all the people that I know who, who I really admire, who I've, I've really enjoyed working with, they've all made me laugh. And and all the jobs that I remember the most, and the ones that I had the most, well, I most enjoyed clearly are the ones that I had the most fun on. Mike, we've reached the part of the show which we like to call Quick Fire Questions. Quick Fire Questions! You've obviously worked with a lot of comedians over the years, but is there anybody who's the funniest business person that you've met? Oh, well, that would be David Jason, yes. I mean, I know he's famous for his business, but without a doubt. And it goes right back to my early days. As a student, I went to see him in uh, The Norman Conquests, which is those marvellous three plays by Alan Aikborn. And he played Norman in it, and uh, the business he did. I mean, just amazing. But uh, that's that's that sort of business. That, and I, when you say business, I always think of the business that you do in comedy. But who is the funniest man that I've ever worked with who actually was a businessman? <clears throat> you see, I don't... I, well, I... I think that would be Bill Kenwright, strangely enough, which goes right back to the thing. He's got a lovely sense of humour. He's got a great sense of enjoyment in life. And I think really that's the thing that's led him to be such a good producer and such a successful producer is the fact that he is able to to enjoy what he does. He, he laughs at failure as much as he laughs at success. You know, he will a show will fail, will will die away. And you know the audience won't come for some reason, but he's loved putting it on. He's loved working with the people he's done done the show with, and you know he's lost some money. Well, there you are. I'll have another go. And I think oh, it's a great attitude. If you create joy, joy comes to you as well. What book makes you laugh? I, I love Terry Pratchett. I have to say, I mean, I've always been a big fan of Terry Pratchett. I discovered him a long, long time ago, uh, and then I. I was fortunate enough to to work with him and do some work for him. I, he he was a fan of Radioactive, the show that I did, and then when he did with great pleasure for the BBC, he asked if I would be one of the readers for it. And I, I by that stage, I was a massive fan of his books. I had every book he'd ever written, and knew them inside out. So I went. My agent said, uh, "So what do you do for Terry Pratchett?" And I went, "What? Oh God! Oh wow!" I, and he turned out to be the most delightful man. He did ring me up once. He said, um, he said, Michael. And I said, hello, Terry, how are you? He said, I'm oh, very well, thank you. Um, now, preferably, Michael, you would be a woman. And I said, what are you talking about, Terry? He said, well, I've been told that apparently women have the most uh, relaxing voices. And so you preferably should be a woman, but... I find your voice very relaxing, Michael. So I'm looking for somebody to be the voice of my burglar alarm. Uh, do you think you could do that? And I said, yes. He said, see, I've, I've got a burglar alarm at the moment, but it doesn't really work. If there's a barn, you know, in the barn, if there's an owl flapping around, he said, the alarm goes off because he thinks someone's there's an intruder. But um, I need something, and I've been in touch with these people, I need something that will differentiate between an owl flapping around in the barn and somebody trying to break into the barn. So um, he said, one of the great advantages of being an incredibly successful writer, Michael, uh, and having sold millions and millions of books, is that I have the funds to, to make something like that happen. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm brilliant. He said, yes, so they're working on it at the moment, and when it gets done, could you be the voice? And I said, I'd be, I'd be delighted. So oh. I am, I was the voice of his burglar alarm. What film makes you laugh? Well, it's slightly controversial, I think, probably nowadays, but the film that, that I remember making me laugh the most in my life and has made me laugh every time I've watched it since is Blazing Saddles. Uh, yes, which is a very silly 
film, full of very silly things, but also an incredibly brave film. It has um, it has a, a scene in it which uses the N word over and over again, and it may be maybe that's why we don't see it. But it's a shame because it's a brilliant use of that thing, written. You know, I, I don't want to get into the politics of it, yeah. but I think it's um, but I think it's. It shows that in a way there if you do comedy right, you can almost do any subject. It's it's just it's got it's got the most extraordinary jokes in it all the way through. It is genius, but uh, it mm. takes me on to my next question, which is what is not funny? You see now that that's it's a question that I've asked myself many times because I am a man who will make jokes about uh, you know, in the right company with people I know who know that I don't necessarily mean it. I will make the sort of joke that you really shouldn't make or people tell us you shouldn't make, you know. So um, I don't know if I can even quote any really, but I, I was the other day, just uh, somebody was talking about a terrible, terrible, appalling situation in Ukraine. Um, I was saying, I know, I know, I mean, you know, and... Uh, it's so difficult to, to, you know, when they come over, you know, to, to make sure that you do get all the uh, the 17-year-old the girls, you know. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm running out of room, but, you know. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and in a way, I'm making a political point. I'm saying that I think we will be faced with this. You know, we were looking at these. In about 10 years' time, when we look back on this situation, we will go, oh, my God, what a... That wasn't only the only humanitarian disaster. I think we will be looking at the most appalling situation with all these terrible, sad poor refugees being sent all over Europe. And I think that it's, it's, we are absolutely open for terrible, terrible things to happen. Yeah, I, and I think it is a coping mechanism. I mean, I'm, I'm the son of a Hungarian refugee. So, mm -hmm. you know, 1956. And uh, it, it really desperately upsets me, the whole mm. thing. But your joke doesn't upset me because... It's done with the right spirit. Yes, and you know it's really... absurd. And you know yeah. that I'm not, this is not real. This is, just, in a way, this is, in a way, it's a, it's a humorous comment on something that is not terribly humorous in itself. You know, it's Barry, Barry Cryer, Barry Cryer's joke is, <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible joke. He said, <laughs> oh God. So you remember Port, lovely Roy Castle, brilliant Roy Castle. And uh, did, he said when he went to the doctors, and they said to him, uh, "Roy, I'm really sorry, but you've got lung cancer. You've, uh, you've you've got six months to live." And Roy Castle said, "I can do it in three. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of course, of course. I would hope that even Roy Castle's family would laugh at that joke. I, yes. I think they would. I think they it's would. About it's a tribute to him in a way. It's an. It's a tribute to him. It's a tribute. But well, that's how we remember him as this. You know. So record breakers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope. Um, I hope. And if it offends people, I apologise because I, I don't ever mean to offend people. It's just some things catch people one way or another way. You know. I mean. I don't know. But yeah, there you but are. Somebody's always going to be offended by something at, at, at some stage. How because... dare you! How dare you say? <laughs> dare you? <laughs> I've never yes. been so insulted in my life. So, no, no, well, well, you should get out more. Um, <laughs> um, they don't meet enough people. <laughs> <laughs> um, what word makes you laugh, Mike? I, I know exactly what it is. It's a word that I like to use, which is kerfuffle. <laughs> I don't know why. What a kerfuffle. It just makes me laugh. Sorry. There you are. Oh. That's it. No, it's good. I, 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 it's, a, it's a funny word, and it's got a K in it as well. Yes. <laughs> which is, Neil, Neil Simon would be very, very happy with that. Yes, I like those rules of comedy, and they generally work, you know? They, they, yeah. they really do. Who was that? Somebody said, never, never deliver a comedy line when you're standing behind a sofa. And you sort of go, oh, oh no, that makes sense. People, people, you're funnier if people can see your legs. Yes. I don't know, Ben, that I seems absurd, why, it? But, but, it, but it is true. Yes. Particularly on stage. Well, if you're on stage, move clear of the furniture before you deliver the punchline. Well, everybody, write that down. Yeah.
no, no, it's brilliant. I, I, to be honest, I'd never heard that, but I, I like it already, and I see mm. why it, it, it is true. I mean, I think I know the answer to this. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? <laughs> I often think that humour is that is too clever is not so funny. So I think uh, you go, oh, that's good. Oh, that's very good. Oh, I see what you've done. They're very clever. Very, very <laughs> clever. It might bring a smile out, but actually just really funny stuff. You you don't comment on it. You don't have time. You just burst into laughter. It makes you guffaw. And, and anything that can make you do that involuntary, ha! It's, that's a, it's an amazing thing when that happens. Yeah, yes. that's a, uh, I, well, the thing about involuntary, isn't it? And that uh, mm. you are, it is a superpower because yeah. you are creating an involuntary act mm -hmm. in somebody else. And yes. that, uh, that is uh, an extraordinary power, isn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, I've, I've experienced it both ways. I've experienced being on stage and doing something that, that I got used to the fact that every single night as I did it, I would always, from somewhere in the auditorium here, <laughs> which was somebody just doing an involuntary sob. Oh. And, and that is a, that's a strange power to have, to know you've got that power, to know that at this moment, you know, I mean, I know this is, you know, that thing of saying you should be in the moment, but I would quite often be, be caught up just before it, about five minutes before thinking, well, that thing's coming up in a minute. I've got to stop thinking about it. But I'd have to stop thinking about it, otherwise it wouldn't work at all, you know. But uh, there was a just, it was a very sad moment. It was a shockingly sad moment. And uh, and almost every night, from somewhere in the auditorium, quite often from several places, you would hear, oh. as people, wow. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's, that is, it is a disturbing thing, but it's the same sort of thing. It's the same, it, it's the same power that you've had, that, that thing of people becoming, losing control of themselves really mm. so I, i'm going to just pick up on that because uh, do you do you think that because that's about invoking you know sad things in in an audience uh, do you think the difference between a a good actor and a great actor is the ability to do comedy i mean is it you know tragedy is easy and comedy is hard or, or <laughs> do you subscribe to that theory um it would seem to to bear fruit, I think, sometimes. There are a lot of very good, serious actors who would say that they can't do comedy. And I think it's because they've not practised it. I think it's because they've not... I don't think you can't do comedy. I think that actually they just... They, they come across something that they go, oh, I know that, that's, that's a funny line, isn't it? Hmm. You see, I don't normally say those. And, and so they lose confidence in themselves. Yes, the great actor, Tim Pickett-Smith, I did a tour with him. He played Salieri in, in Amadeus. Extraordinary performance. I mean, absolutely marvellous. There were one or two moments in the play where Salieri has jokes. I mean, he actually says things that are supposed to, written deliberately, to get the audience to laugh, you know, to break the spell, as it were. Uh, often self-mocking, you know, the, the character says things, you know, to to break his own seeming importance and he would say night after night i just can't, I can't get a laugh on that. i don't know why it's i know it's supposed to get a laugh i just can't get a laugh and he often said to me because he knew i'd done a lot of comedy he said what, what am i doing wrong mike and i didn't really want to say because it seemed rude but in the end i said well you're trying too hard and he said what do you mean i said well you're you're trying to be funny and therefore people see it coming You've got to say it exactly the same as you say all the other lines. It's There's no difference. You know it's funny, and you should be aware that it's funny, and therefore you should time it. But, you know, you, you have that timing. Naturally, we all we all do. And, in fact, sometimes the timing of a comedy line is not what you would think. It's not ba -da 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 -dum, beat, boom. It's not that. It's It can be... You can take people by surprise, but you can do it fast. You can come in much earlier than people expect. Or that there are many ways to play it to say a funny line that there, there are very few rules that work when it comes to comedy i think you know the rule of three tends to work that things are funnier in threes you know? yeah. and and that's been shown to be the case over and over and over again but he you know eventually i said to him well stop just don't 
forget it. You know, it's not that funny a line anyway. I mean, I don't think they're going to you're going to get a round of applause on it. It's quite a funny, you know, it's a reason to be funny. You said, yeah, forget it. And of course, he went out that night, said the line, and got a big laugh. <laughs> Almost threw him, I think. He came off and went, what was that? What What did I do? I said, you did nothing. That's the point. You did nothing. But, uh, but you know, what a great man to be uh, with the work that he'd done and, and the things that he had behind him, to have that um, that lack of lack of pomposity, to sort of go, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here, to recognise that in himself. I thought it was great. Fabulous story. And finally, Mike, desert island gags. You can only take one gag with mm, you to a desert island. What is it? Well, it has to be. Oh, God. I've, you know, when you've asked me this, I've thought long and hard because I do have several. In the end, in the end I'm absolutely going to pick the Bob Monkhouse joke, which I think is, you know, written by Bob Monkhouse and I think probably one of the most succinct and beautiful jokes ever written, which is, when I die, I want to die peacefully in my sleep, like my father, not screaming in terror like his passengers. <laughs> it is a It's perfection, classic. isn't it? It's perfection. It is perfection, and it's, it's so precise. It's just, and... there's not a word out of place. It's unbelievable. No, and, and, uh, and you haven't put a word out of place either, Mike. Thank <laughs> you so much for... A, proving that you don't stop laughing because you grow old, you grow old because you stop laughing. And B, thank you for being a fabulous guest on the Humorology podcast. It's been a joy to be on this podcast. Thank you. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.